<laughs> okay, well, a clash of values might be quite a good segue into um, Sarah Hardcastle, who is a consultant with uh, Carrington Crisp. Because the other variable in all of this, we've been hearing about how the academics and the business studies community will need, uh, are trying to rethink how they do their courses. But of course, uh, students are exercising their values when they choose courses. And we've heard about some of the values that they're bringing and much more challenging, uh, different sets of expectations. And of all the different variables that could suddenly alter uh, how universities and colleges prosper or not, uh, the one that's been the sort of sleeping giant has been uh, student behavior and choice, which has remained very robust, very willing to pay fees. Um, but uh, every other survey tells us that their uh, values are burbling away in different directions. <laughs> so we thought we would ask uh, Sarah to give us an insight into what the students want, what they expect, and uh, is there a disconnect in any of that that you can see coming over the horizon? Thank you very much. So, I'm Sarah Hardcastle from County Crisp. I'm here to talk to you about tomorrow's student. I have the honour, or perhaps some would say the dubious honour, of spending a large percentage of my life talking to prospective and current students, to faculty and professional staff, uh, to alumni and to employers via one-on-one -on -one interviews, focus groups, and listening to their views uh, that come in via anonymous surveys. I'm here to talk to you today about Okay. Um, five key trends. So who is a student and where might they come from? Uh, this is with a particular focus on the business school arena. Um, expectations from the student's experience, especially with the increase in fees and perhaps especially with the increase of parental influence. The demand for soft skills, as we've heard earlier, um, knowledge is everywhere, but to learn to lead, to motivate, to manage, to network, to negotiate, these are all things that are very valuable, but also transferable. And flexibility is key. We think students are going to want to dip in and out of learning um, and refer to it as lifestyle learning and throughout their careers as they hit different, different challenges, and we'll come on to more about that in a minute. And it is career, career, career. Um, there's a huge focus on outcome, and we see up to a third of MBAs wanting to run their own business now. So it's not necessarily the traditional careers of the past. So the traditional three-year degree with an 18-year-old student, well, it still has a future, but perhaps that student isn't going to be on campus for the whole of the, uh, the time. And to have a sustainable su supply of students we feel that business schools need to widen the net. They need to think about apprentice degrees, as we heard earlier. If I look just simply into my own family, my niece, definitely university material, deferred her place for a year. She now works for Transport for London. She's doing project, she's studying project management. She's gaining credits to complete her degree at the end of her apprenticeship. And that was very much a parental guided decision because they didn't want her to have the amount of debt and because they did want her to have the work experience and the job in the end. And we think business schools for students also need to look across the university to students and to alumni of other faculties. Chemists, engineers, psychologists, all will need business skills. A lot of them will need business skills. And I have to say some, not all, but some business schools we see struggling to engage with their own alumni, let alone those from across the university. And more and more there's a trend of the contact being about fundraising rather than anything else, rather than actually engaging with the alumni. And I did a, a call with an alumnus um, last year where they said to me, you know what, it's the first time they've asked my opinion and you haven't asked for money at the end. Now that you have done that, next time they call, I will give money. And it is about engagement first, but alumni can give so much more than fundraising. 
In addition to that, business schools have to be prepared to support portfolio and contractor careers. And those that have hit the glass ceiling, and as we heard earlier, perhaps those wanting to change role or sector, or perhaps even country, needing new skills, needing new networks too. Um, I spoke this, just this week to an Indian alumnus from an MBA program in the UK. And she'd gone to work for a company and then gone to start her own business. By that point, she'd lost contact with her business school in the UK. Her loyalties were to there. She went to another local business school to get support with her business. And finally, international. The key to international student enrolments is to look where the middle class is developing. Um, this is a map from the DUI created in 2013, um, looking at rapidly developing middle classes. Now, in the short term, you probably wouldn't want to visit some of these places on a recruitment uh, drive, but medium term or longer term, perhaps that's gonna be okay. And EY are forecasting that the middle class will grow hugely over the next two decades. And by 2030, two thirds of the middle class will be in the Asia Pacific region. Which brings me on to the point of diversity. Um, we see some business schools fighting really hard to protect the diversity of their cohorts. Um, and it is quite a struggle. We see some programs where they're dominated by one nationality. And that means sometimes as bad as worse English when they go back home than they came to this country with. Um, it means less learning across the cohort. It causes huge problems in group work. And it doesn't work for either side. It doesn't work for the majority nationality, and it doesn't work for the minorities either. And I think if this map is right, then business schools need to find a strategy to deal with this. And we'll come on to a little bit more about that in a moment. And society has changed. We aren't audiences anymore, and I think these two pictures just, just say it all. We are stakeholders, we're content creators. Um, and it's really important to get your story straight. It's really important to get the student experience uh, straight. And we see a good web and digital presence as really key. Um, but it's a balance between good design. I've seen a fantastic, beautiful business school website absolutely slated by students because they couldn't find the information quickly. And that's information like course, costs and career. But more than that, people are wanting authentic information. So whereas in the past an anonymous um, story about a member of their alumni where they've gone to work just with an industry, it doesn't work anymore. They want specifics, even better if you can get the alumnus to talk on video. But more than that, we're seeing a trend where prospective students actually want to talk to your alumni. And they've got access. That's the really scary thing. They, they can use social media for access, which makes the student experience even more important. This is from our Generation Web Study, which we've been running for quite some years now. And in 2010, just 4% were using their smartphone as their main tool for going online. They perhaps have a quick look and then move to something else. In 2015, this rose to 61%, and I'm actually quite surprised it's as low as that. We've also seen a growth in students using social media to support their studies, and I think technology to support studies, rather than as the main means of delivering, is actually really important to them. Now, in a dark corner of your family, or maybe even of your home, you probably find one of these lurking somewhere. I'm not even sure they know I took their photograph yesterday. Um, fortunately, only one of them's mine. We, um, we've taken to texting when food's ready, because that's the only way to get attention, because they've got noise cancelling headphones on all the time. The reason I'm introducing you to Zach and Joel is that we have seen increasing use of video downloads from websites, from university and business school websites. And they're 13. When they search, they don't go to Google, they go to YouTube first. 
And when I ask them why, they just look at me as if it's a no-brainer. Why read when you can watch? If they possibly can, they have their books on audio. Again, why read when you can listen? But also they can do something else at the same time. And it's not just the boys. There's this kind of, I think, stereotype that it is the boys. And it's not. The girls are pretty much as bad. And we're just beginning to see some innovative marketing. Um, in particular, if you haven't seen it, I'd point out a video from BI Norwegian Business School called Flying Start. Um, I don't know what it's done for them in terms of recruitment, but in terms of awareness, brand awareness, it's had 1.2 million views. How many of your marketing departments would not die to have something like that? So what do students value when they're making choices about where to study? Well, you'll be pleased to know it is still academic reputation. But I'm afraid academics have to be able to teach too. And it's not always my experience that they can. Um, and it's gonna be even more important with the introduction of TEF. And then overall brand and reputation on the way in, it's what family and peers think about it, the people they talk to. On the way out, it's employers. Nobody wants to sit in an interview and explain where they studied and why they chose to study there. A focus group last year with an international student, she'd been accepted on two MBA programmes in the UK. She chose the one that was, in her view, the poorer. Now, she didn't do that because of location or because of cost. She did it because of the overall reputation of the institution and of the business school, because she said to me, that's what stays on my CV. And finally, on this one, value for money. We hear time and again in focus groups, students talking about a cost versus rankings calculation. I hear questions about, is the student a customer? In my mind, it's why would you think that they're not a customer? It's one of the biggest purchases they'll make in their lives. And I think lots of us have probably had friends, I know certainly from my background in the city, I've had friends say to me, how much do I need to spend? How much can I get away with? Does it need to be there? Or actually, do I have to bite the bullet and can it be there? But we see more and more value judged on outcome. Um, and we, see, we hear that they're prepared, pe prepared to pay more if the outcome is likely to be better. And while you really, really can't overpromise, what you can do is use stories of your alumni, real stories, real people. And not just the stars, yes, the stars are important for brand building, but with the best will in the world, very few of us are going to end up working at Google or at Apple. So real stories of real people of where they really might end up. And in terms of careers, what do they value with career outcome? Well, CVs and interviews at all levels. The number of times I have an e email or a phone call from a friend saying, can you just look at this? Or how should, how should I pitch this? Um, but career support perhaps isn't going to be traditional. Perhaps it's not just the big job in a multinational company. I did an interview recently with a marketing director, um, a well-known communications brand. And it was a brand that certainly at their age, I would have been proud to put on my CV. And she said, I can't get any interns. <laughs> so why not? They all want to work agency side and it's causing us a problem. And it's understanding the aspirations of your students in terms of designing the career support that I think is really important. And business startup, not just startup support when they're studying or when they finish studying, but further down the line and then growth support as well and continuing that relationship so they can dip in and out of their studying. And real world learning time and again, we hear the added value of real world learning and we've heard a lot about it this afternoon already. They want to pitch for a real customer. They want to be able to make mistakes in a real environment, but mistakes that aren't going to affect their career. 
They want to work on a real project. And those business schools that give them that opportunity, the students really value it. My godson lectures at Brunel in computer game design. The number of internships available are tiny and they really struggle with this, or they did. What they've done, it's a faculty initiative, is set up a computer game design agency using university facilities in the summer months. And that, that way they give their students real work experience. And I think business schools perhaps need to be a little more innovative about the businesses they can run from on campus. I know some do it, but there are lots that don't. And finally, I think where real world learning is really critical is with international students. Certainly certain nationalities with the work study visa situation, it needs to be part of programs. Because if these international students come over here and their English doesn't improve, and they don't learn from a diversely international cohort, and they don't build a diversely international network, and they don't get any Western work experience, why are they going to come? And finally, specialisation. I think the way probably to demonstrate how people are craving skills for specific industries is to look at the MBA specialist marketplace. If we look here, MBAs on media, on aviation, sports and music management, and on space. And if you search for MBA, you also get the Lego Master Builder Academy for Lego Star Wars. We haven't yet found an MBA in Star Wars, but no doubt there will be one sometime in the future. And finally, this is from our Tavares MBA study with a thousand prospective MBAs. Um, we've just published the report, the 2016 report. And the skills they're looking for, leadership, critical thinking skills, entrepreneurial mindset, negotiation and communication leading the way. But we did have a little bit of a giggle here because judgment, intuition and self-awareness are in the bottom three because clearly all prospective MBAs have that already. <laughs> Moving on swiftly. Um, so to sum up, what do we know about tomorrow's students? Well, they are going to be more diverse. Diverse in terms of age, in terms of experience and in terms of origin. And they're going to want flexibility to study around their lifestyles and to dip in and out. And what they want to learn is changing. Yes, it's knowledge. And yes, it's knowledge taught well. But also they can look some of that up. They do want to, to develop their soft skills and they really want real world experience. So they want this great academic experience, but they have this really strong driving focus on career, on an outcome. And that outcome is really part of a focus on return on investment, especially with growing fees. And looking at the postgraduate marketplace, we hear time and again, it's about me. It's my learning, it's my development, it's my investment in the future. It's my time for me.